So today we're going to talk about lectins, not leptin. So of course lectins with a C will affect your leptin levels, which we'll discuss as well. So going to the first slide, and actually I better click myself here. Interesting, the British Medical Journal actually showed back in 1988 that healthy isn't always smart. They decided to do a little experiment and they offered their folks a healthy meal alternative. It was a, a bean meal, and it actually was red kidney beans, and people ate them. And when they ate them, they actually got ill. Many of us have, of course, consumed beans, and we know it will blow to us, cause flatulence and lots of gas. But interesting enough, these people actually had diarrhea, vomiting, being in a hospital, they tested for pathogens, there were no pathogens. So in 99, there was this comment in the British Medical Journal, it's like, hmm, do dietary lectins cause disease? And so that will be the nature of our lecture today, and the answer is yes. And so as we tell our patients, go eat more healthy, go eat whole wheat bread, cut out the meat, eat more nuts and seeds, can we be doing them a disservice? And the answer is possibly yes. So what they found was they tested this meal that these people consumed that made them ill in the hospital, and they found it was particularly high in lectin, phytohemagglutinin. Strangely enough, hemagglutinins also cause blood viscosity, increasing risk for disease, hypoperfusion, and exacerbating disease as well. So the harsh reality is our body has lectins in it. In fact, the C-reactive protein is a lectin. Opsonin is a lectin. We have E-selectin. It's a lectin. Strangely enough, 30% of the foods we consume, of course, are lectin-rich. The question is, which ones are those? So as a process of elimination, some of you know, are familiar with Dr. Diodamo's work, eat right for your blood type. Our blood types, of course, how do they measure blood types? Via lectins. So once again, we see lectins all over the place, but in our healthcare education, we weren't really taught what does lectin mean. So hopefully by the end of this conversation, we'll know not only what does it mean to us, but also what does it mean to our patients. Lectins are not readily digested by our digestive enzymes or the digestive enzymes you take, and they're not readily digested by your hydrochloric acid or your gastric aids that you may be using. So they cause inflammation throughout the body. They trigger histamine levels. They trigger thrombin levels. They also can trigger cytokine and tuber necrosis factor alpha. It causes inflammation in the body. It can also cause blood fluid leakage out of our vasculature. We all know we have some 60,000 miles of blood vessels. 18,000 miles of those blood vessels are capillaries, so narrow that a red blood cell can only go single file. As you're sitting there, 27% of the resistance that your heart is pumping against is occurring from those 18,000 miles of capillaries. Mind you, if you're five or 10 pounds overweight, for every extra pound, you have an additional 250 miles of blood vessels, more resistance. And why are those capillaries creating so much resistance? Because it's like a highway, three lanes to two lanes to one lanes, your red blood cells can only go single file. As Dr. Sinatra is mentioning, what happens if that blood's thicker? Well, lectins can make that blood a lot thicker as we're gonna find out. Opsonins also are substances that coat foreign substances that enter our bodies. They trigger the immune response. It's also a lectin. So C-reactive protein's a lectin, mannose binding protein's a lectin. Many of you may have used mannose or D-mannose for urinary tract infections. It's just a natural sugar, but acts as a decoy protein. And one of the solutions of dealing with lectins in our diet is of course using decoy sugars so they don't bind onto your sugars within your body. So look at here, a macrophage. So think of phagocytosis, the little green bar represents a lectin, and it's gonna actually coat and bind with that antigen, triggering, look at me, attack me, hyperimmune response. Something we don't want, whether it's high pollen counts and or any other protein, which of course our body is perceiving as a foreign invader. Lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. So just think lectins are proteins. They're looking to bind and mate up with a carbohydrate in your body. Your body actually per weight, all 75 trillion cells, is about 11% carbohydrate binding sites. So it's looking to bind on to these proteins. So things like tubers, so root vegetables, cereals, potatoes, beans, grains, eggs, dairy, are all known as provo provocative lectins, which will trigger immune responses, as well as a myriad of other things which we'll discuss with references on the future slides here. Until recently, the main use for lectins were to test for blood types. But now we know they're toxic, they're inflammatory, we know that C-reactive protein's a problem. 
We also know that there's a lot of other inflammatory markers that not only cause inflammation within our bodies and our patients' bodies, but also, of course, trigger other immunological problems, increasing risk for cancers and other things. It's resistant to cooking, resistant to heating, resistant to digestive enzymes, and it's present in the vast majority of our food. It is pervasive and it is dangerous, and they're called lectins. So, of course, the blood types, we know that we use lectins in a purified form to see what blood type we are. Diodamo, if you know, eat right for your blood type, he did a lot of writing on this topic. So if you're type O, you might be more carnivore. If you're type A, you should eat chicken, not beef. That concept, though maybe not purely founded in exact science, actually is probably pretty close. That eat like your ancestors did. It worked for them. It might work for us. But let's say, but my ancestors, they always ate wheat. But they eat genetically modified wheat. Just like if we were to look back at a Hispanic or Spanish culture where they might have had corn, today's ear of corn that we enjoy during the 4th of July festival is not what they had eons ago. We've cultivated it as something it's not. So these are the symptoms that your patients may present with. And you can say, well, I've already food allergy tested them. They don't have any food sensitivities. I did an IgG, IgE, IgA. I did provocative cytotoxicity testing. Whatever that testing might have been, even if all those tests came back perfect, the foods can still be offending them. And that's why sometimes they're frustrating patients. Lots of times we get the low-lying fruit. Okay, yeah, they have a little peanut allergy or they have a little something, and their migraines went away. We always love those easy cases that make us look good, but we also have those frustrating cases. So what about the headaches, which didn't get better after doing the food allergy testing? There's still possibly a food culprit which is getting to them, much like the straw on the proverbial camel's back. Skin problems, acne, bloating, fluid retention, respiratory problems, chronic mucus problems. They might have an environmental allergen, and now that's a burden to them. But now they're eating a food still, regardless of all the testing you may have done, which is still burdening them. So once again, we're going to talk about solutions here, not just the downside of lectins. Bedwetting in children. Infertility. We know there's some 12 million couples in the U.S. which have infertility problems, and that's a conservative number. And once again, menstrual irregularities. Of course, we know that there's lots of research on gluten and, of course, schizophrenia and psychological issues. It's bountiful in research, but now where does lectin fall into that? We're going to talk about that too. So let's look at lectins a little closer. It's a protein. It's looking to lock on to a carbohydrate. Remember, 11% of your body weight is a carbohydrate that's looking to be bound on to. All plants and animals have lectins. It's believed to be a protective mechanism. So just like if you ate something with a prickly cactus barb on it, you're probably not going to eat it. Well, this can actually make people feel sick, like eating beans that aren't cooked. And we're also talking about sprouting of foods, sprouting of your grains. But once again, it's a carbohydrate lectin lock. But what's interesting, these locks or these receptors are in your gut. Of course, we know that some of the vast majority of not only your serotonin, but your melatonin is in your gut, right? In fact, there's quite a bit of research now showing not only that serotonin is mostly in your gut and not your brain, but now the melatonin is, and there's a whole vast variety of applications there relative to disease processes. So if we don't have a healthy gut, we don't have a healthy you, we don't have a healthy patient base.